Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Foskett, organizer of Gestalt IT and Tech Field Day, and we are here at Commvault Go in 2019 in Denver, Colorado. As you can see, we are high in the mountains at a beautiful campsite. We got a beautiful uh, stream right behind us. In fact, it looks like we're in the stream. Um, a tent set up next to the stream, uh, lots of mosquitoes there. But uh, you know, as people are wont to do around a campfire in the mountains of Colorado, we're going to talk about backup scheduling today. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce my guests. Uh, Chris, you want to introduce yourself first? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, my name's Chris Evans. I'm analyst, blogger, um, various other different things, ex-consultant. You can find me at Chris M. Evans on Twitter and my website, architecting.it. All right, hi everyone. My name is Chin Fa from Malaysia. Um, I'm just an IT consultant, and uh, my blog is actually storagegaga.com, and I tweet at storagegaga. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Ray Lucchese. I'm a Greybeard on Storage podcaster. I'm a Ray on Storage blogger, and I am Silverton Consulting. So. So one of the things that a lot of us have experienced, obviously we've all been in storage for a while, uh, maybe even a long while, uh, Thank you, Steve. I remember uh, setting up backup schedules a long, long time ago. It was an article of religion, right? You had incrementals, 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 and then you did a full on the weekends. And, and, and I never really questioned that. But of course, um, it, it, the reason that we did that was actually technical, not, um, not practical. It was because that's how backups had to be done, because that was the only way to make them fit in the time available. Um, things have changed, right? Uh, who wants to talk about the, the old times versus the new times? I'll start us off on the old times. So um, I did uh, back at many, 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 many locations, many, many different platforms, starting from the mainframe arena. And as you said, you scheduled your full backup once a week, usually at the weekend, um, and incrementals during the week to pick up any changes. But you hope that you had enough network bandwidth at the weekend to get through the, all of the, um, the backups you needed to do. Um, quite a few of the places I worked, we ended up spreading them across the whole week because we got to a point where we couldn't do that on the network either. So it became really, a, as you said, a challenge to, to get the, the backup through. And one of the other things obviously tied to that was the fact that you would spend weeks, hours going through each of your um, applications and trying to pick a schedule about when you wanted to back them up during the course of the day to make sure you could be both maximize network bandwidth and fit in with the requirements of the application. So there was a lot of, a lot of effort to get that done. And actually not to forget the three generations of tapes, you know, the grandfather, father and son kind of policy. Um, that actually has been like Wasn't going there on for the longest time. Towers of Hanoi thing in there yes, someplace? Yes, there is. Right. You want to share that? No, I, I, I can't. I don't even remember what it is, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But then again, snapshots came along, and then all of a sudden, backup windows weren't really a problem anymore. They're hardly even worth discussing at this point because with a snapshot, your 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 online activity comes back in line with within seconds, and then it just takes whatever, you know, half an hour sort of backup, 100, 200 terabytes of data or something like that. Mm -hmm. Assuming you can do it that way, assuming really? that your system can take that's that sort of backup. That's correct. And then you've got enough space to do it, and then you've got somewhere to ship that snapshot off afterwards. And then you've got you to actually have to move the data someplace. Yeah, but then you've got the offload issue of moving that snapshot. Yeah, of course. I think but ultimately things will change. Right? If you look at the um, recovery that we need to actually now uh, attend to, uh, we have to look at the RPO, the recovery point objective. And I think things like snapshots, things like CDP, uh, does actually affect it quite a bit, and has been you know, changing the landscape. And yeah, well, I mean, snapshots made things uh, a little bit easier, but they sort of moved the window to some extent from being a operational aspect to you know how long your online systems were going to be down to how long can you actually take to back up that storage before you have to back it up again. You know. Okay. Yeah. So um, I, I'm glad that you bring up CDP because, of course, um, you know, I was uh, when I was writing for Storage Magazine in the 90s and the 2000s. That was like one of the big topics that we were writing about was, you know, CDP and how it was going to change everything and how backup was going to, you know, be obsolete because we were going to have continuous data protection. But of course, um, that it, it's funny. It seemed like it was a product at the time, but it wasn't a product. It was a feature. And um, it, it, what happened to CDP over the years? What, what do you think? It didn't work. Well, there's that. Because ah, it didn't. It ah, didn't. It, it did didn't. Yeah, it did yeah. Can't so, work. if you're back, uh, backing up at a block level for an application that's transactional based, and you turn back the clock on CDP to a block 
update, you might or might not be part of a transaction. So you you don't you don't get an alignment between the application consistent Are you on backup. application consistency? Absolutely, it's, yeah, it's which, like, you which know, is hard to do. Like VSS, right, volume channel copy services, right, you've got to actually integrate with the framework in order for you to back it up consistently. Would you class that as CDP? Um, it may be, all right, if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Ray, you've obviously got a different opinion. So CDP has its challenges. It's not perfect. It, it can do certain things, and it, it can't do certain things. Databases are probably not something you want your CDP to work for, but exactly. file systems and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, 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 for, yeah true. Yeah, that, that. that would be fair. So is it still a thing, or is it uh, gone gone with the wind, gone in the mists of time? There are plenty of systems out there that are using CDP today and, and tout it as, 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 a, as its capability and features, right? There are definitely systems out there, and there are vendors bringing new products to the market. I can think of one I won't name, but it was introduced, what, three or four years ago, maybe? But you don't see that being a killer feature, I don't think, anymore. No. No, no it seems like the, the, the industry uh, sort of looked at that, considered it, and then moved on. And uh, so the next thing, that, the other thing that Ray mentioned and uh, you know, that Chinfa brings up as well is the idea of application consistency. And the reason that uh, you know, a lot of this stuff didn't work is because essentially um, you know, we needed to have consistency across, across data, across applications. That's, of course, one reason that we originally had the backup window, because basically we would pick a time when the applications weren't in use. And of course, you remember when there was no internet? Remember when there was no 24-7 business? And you could be like, eh, nothing's going to happen after midnight. We'll just do whatever we want for a few hours. You know, No problem. There's no data in there. So basically, we were doing application consistency based on uh, the calendar and the clock. And but taking of course, the systems down and all that stuff. It, yeah. was, it, was, a, it was a serious endeavor, and, and you wanted to try to minimize that, that exposure or that downtime, that sort of stuff. Yeah, those, days, thank yeah. God those days are gone, aren't yeah. they? <laughs> remember when we could take systems down? It was like, oh man, you know what? We, we won't need this for a while. We're just going to shut this guy down. Uh, I'm doing some work on him. Yeah. So, uh, but things have changed uh, technically now. So uh, where are we now? How, how has backup uh, scheduling changed uh, as of 2019? I think from the, um, you know, the time, the, the kind of uh, scheduling that we work on right now, right, there are a lot of other factors that's actually affecting how we do backup. For example, let's say ransomware, right? If you, don't, if you keep using the same kind of method, it's very hard for you to recover from ransomware. And so you have things like snapshots, we have shorter RPOs and so on. I think that makes a lot of sense. So I think it definitely has changed beyond that, that traditional backup, you know, the way you schedule it. And, then, and if you look at things like in-memory database, how are you going to back up that, right? So, True. Um, we shouldn't forget virtualization. We shouldn't forget that we've got a totally different API and data path for getting backup data out or change data out of an application, which made a big difference. And obviously, there's lots of companies that um, founded their solutions based on that, that ability. So we're not being forced to take data across the front-end network anymore. We're taking it from back-end storage or through the hypervisor. So we've got a completely different approach as well. And I think that allows us to do more interesting things. Yep. Yeah, I think the challenge is you still have to get that data, whether it's change block or, or uh, application data or, or snapshots, you need to get that data off the primary storage onto something outside of that environment and something called secondary storage. What, like a secondary storage system something that's like not that. connected yeah, to the primary? To, okay. The challenge is how much time does it take to move that data and you know how, how much parallelism you can drive into that, into that <coughs> process. And you know if you're sitting there taking 23 hours to back up, I don't know, a couple hundred terabytes of data, is it, you know, can you survive? You can't, you can't survive that. Because if you, if you screw something up, you're dead. You have to start over again. You've lost all that backup at that point. Well, that brings me to another uh, another thought. Um, so, obviously, we've all heard buzzwords in the industry. God help us, buzzwords. Uh, but big data is one of the one of those buzzwords. And basically, my definition of big data is too big data. So basically, anytime the data is too big to do whatever it is that you would do with it, suddenly it goes from being data to being big data. And so I think that this has a lot to do with backup scheduling as well. As you were saying, Ray, once, once the data gets too big, or as Shinfa was saying, like in-memory database or something like that, <laughs> that could be too big as well or too That's challenging. Right. Uh, essentially, y there are things that are a, a huge challenge to backup and to protect, and they have to be protected in an entirely different way. Not to mention, of course, web applications and Office 365 and all that kind of stuff. But, but let's think about... Um, Let's think about that. Uh, how does how does this this age of massive 
data volumes. So, I mean, if you look at you look at data lakes today, a lot of them are, if they're backed up at all, we're talking petabyte, multi-petabyte types of uh, amounts of data, they're replicated. So instead of having, I don't know, one petabyte of real primary data, you now have two petabytes or three petabytes of data sitting around in order to be able to do uh, analytics on it. But I don't think you can back up a petabyte. I, I no, you know, you have to compute what the backup of a petabyte would take. It's probably take a week. Or more. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, but that's the thing, right? I think nowadays you can see a lot of vendors actually, you know, advocating this data fabric, you know, a single tier that um, goes across. It doesn't matter whether it's primary or secondary, right? So in it, you know, I'm actually a big advocate of snapshots that keeps happening across that single tier. So, you know, I think that from that point of view, the recovery is actually much easier compared to a traditional one. I think, just talking about data lakes again, Ray, I think just your, your topic, um, I would question whether that's the sort of data you really need to back up, the same way you would have backed up a traditional application that needed backing up once a week or once a day or twice a day. Um, partly because you may not have a big deal or a big issue if you lose some of that data. So you could perhaps rely on a system that does erasure coding geographically so you can mitigate some of the failures of the hardware system that might, might happen. So I just wonder whether you really do need to back up in the same way. Because once you've got to that volume of data, you might not be really that bothered about end of every individual transaction. So, so one thing this week that was kind of interesting, and, and I'm not sure, I think it was Patrick uh, McGrath had mentioned it, but you know, if you look at your backup data, sometimes that represents almost the biggest data lake in a, in a customer's environment. Because it's sitting there, it's effectively isolated from primary storage, and if you could actually access it and analyze it and do some work with it, it's an interesting thing. But you know, when you start talking, well, the other thing about multi-petabyte or, or pri it, you can replicate the data across to different systems. That's an option. Some storage provides that. Some uh, backup solutions also provide replication, asynchronous replication. You can do synchronous replication for very mission critical data. Uh, but that's not exactly what I would consider backup because there's no air gap between those two. And they're both on the same storage media, maybe distance located. You know, Separated. Well, and also the an, one of the essential characteristics of backup, it's not just um, a copy of the data, it's an indexed copy of the data. An indexed yeah, copy yeah. of the data that allows you to find what you're looking for. So um, I, I think that a lot of these snapshot-based and replication-based uh, alleged data protection solutions are not actually data protection at all because there is no index. Yep, yep, fair point. You think points. an index is required for data protection? I certainly do. You want to have that argument? No. <laughs> okay. Not necessarily. No. I, I no. I do just simply because otherwise it's extremely hard to use it. Um, you know, when was this copy made and what is on this copy? If you can't answer those questions, then you don't have a backup. So I mean, replication is not like I say. It's not a backup, and it's not, not just because it doesn't have an index. But you're not going to necessarily try to restore your replicant to the primary storage unless it's like a failover, fail back situation. When you fail over from a you know, in a replicated environment, you're moving all your, your mission critical production, production to that other environment. And you're not really restoring per se as much as activating a secondary copy. That's replication, but that's not backup. So uh, one of the things that Ray just mentioned, though, is, uh, and this is, I think, a big trend in the industry as well, is using that uh, data lake of your secondary storage uh, for some productive business use. I mean, we heard about the Analyze uh, product uh, this week as well. And um, it seems to me that, that that is certainly beneficial to the business. But is it, in a way, corrupting the purpose of backup? Are we, are we at risk of, of losing something by seeing secondary storage as secondary storage instead of as data protection. I guess it's the same old story. It's a poor man's archive, isn't it? You know, effectively, you should be moving data out into a proper archive and accessing it that way um, for many reasons. Obviously, one being it will take data out of the primary systems and make it easier to back those primary systems up. They won't take as long to, to back up. But also, you can then protect them differently. You know, you can put them on different mediums. Um, that's most appropriate for what, for what you intend to do with it. So. I see why people have done it, because it's a lazy, easy way to do it, but I don't necessarily think it's a good way, because one of the other things you have to bear in mind is you could be keeping data a lot longer than you intend, and that could have legal or compliance consequences when you should really be getting rid of that data very early on. Okay, I think speaking about data, lake, I think you know backup is, is probably impossible if you look at it from a volume point of view, but it might be better for you to actually 
you know, do something with the data, try to catalog it, um, categorize it, give it some kind of classification, and then actually apply the backup differently for each one of the, the categories. I mean, the whole Activate product, to some extent, you can see how they're, they're, they're spanning the primary, secondary storage boundary anymore because they're, you know, they're looking for, for sensitive data in primary storage and backups, and, and they're able to purge it in both locations optionally and stuff like that. So, I mean, GDPR and you know, the ability to forget and all that stuff has, got, uh, has gotten people to start thinking about what is actually on my backup data and what is exposed there as well. I mean, there's big security exposure with backup data, don't get me wrong. That's a whole other topic. Absolutely, that's actually a topic we're going to be recording for the Gestalt IT podcast this afternoon. That's right. So, uh, but um, let me get back to the to the core uh, question here, and uh, then, by the way, we can take some questions or comments from the folks in the audience if you if you want. Just uh, be ready to raise your hand, and I'll uh, throw this box at you, and then you can uh, speak into it. Um, so back to the, uh, the the core question: backup scheduling. One of the things that we heard from Commvault on stage on the keynote today was uh, the idea that somehow AI and ML would allow dynamic backup scheduling magic that would change everything. Is, is that, well first, does that make sense to you? And second, do you think that's really here? First of all, I think uh, it's good to have all those you know, nice little words like AL, you know, sorry, AI or machine learning, that kind of thing, right? It simplifies, it uh, improves operational efficiencies and that sort of things. But maybe the other way is to think about recoverability, right? Looking at it and say that, okay, instead of just following a backup regime and so on, let's focus on recoverability of data. How fast and how quick do you need the data to be back online to you? I think some of the things that I like always is always snapshots, replication, and on the other side, on the secondary uh, side itself, you can actually very quickly turn that over into a production uh, environment, so I like I mean, that. I mean, think what you need to know in order to really do a, an effective backup schedule. Really know, need to know how long it's going to take me to move uh, snapshot data from point A to point B. If you can have machine intelligence or artificial intelligence uh, to be able to say, okay, for an Oracle database of 200 terabytes, this is the time frame it takes to move from disk to tape or disk to S3 or something like that. That sort of information could be critical when you're trying to schedule a backup and, and understand what, what you can and can't back up in a particular window or something like that. I would suggest that we divide things into two. First of all, I think we haven't really talked about requirements that the business might have. And the business isn't going to be bothered about when you schedule the backup per se, but they'll have a business requirement to choose when to backup and how frequently and so on. So I would say that from the front end, you would want to have the business defining the terms and the requirements based on standard things like RTO, RPO, and so on. If you've then got some machine intelligence at the back end that then says, right, we can get that through or we can't get it through or you know, there'll be an overrun, great. But let's try and make that hidden in the, in the application in the background and let's make it more about business requirements rather than having to manually think about scheduling at the front end. But that, that, that's absolutely a very good point because, of course, that, that's always one of the things that always galled me about backup schedules generally was because we were doing what was practical based on technology, not what the business actually wanted or what the business actually needed. But of course, we're probably all IT folks in here, and most IT folks understand that uh, it's, it's sort of a cop-out to say, oh, what does the business want? Has the business ever told you what they wanted in a way that was useful? I mean, that's just not something that happens. So, you know, how do we bridge this? How do we, how do we deal with this? I think we can all agree that backup schedules are contrived and potentially useless, but how do we bridge that gap? Useless. Backup schedule? No, I don't believe that at all. I mean, the challenge with, with anything in IT to some extent is how can you deal with the, with the environment that you have to provide the services that people want in an effective and economical manner? And backup schedules are an example of doing that. And without backup schedules, I don't think the world exists in IT. I mean, at least the backup schedule is comprehensible to the average person. I mean, I think, I think most people have kind of grokked the idea that, you know, the system is backed up every night. You know, even, even like normal non-IT people can kind of understand what that means. If we move to more frequent backups, I mean, you know, I use Time Machine on my machine. Uh, it doesn't really have a schedule. It backs up when it backs up, and it backs up again 
at some point that's after that. Actually, if you look at Time Machine, it does have a schedule. I mean, you have to go inside and see what's going on, but it is doing a scheduled backup of some type. But that's precisely what's happening, right? The business doesn't really care what the schedule is like. It's like you just have to be ready that I can get my data back whenever something happens. Just another thought on that. Um, we talked about MLAI a second ago, mm -hmm. about how you would do that. I just wonder whether there's something that we could actually use from the storage layer that actually allowed us to say, this is the quietest time for the application. This is the time where if we took a snapshot, we'd capture the most data. Um, this is the way that if we snapshotted it, it would minimize the time it would take to recover because we'd have less forward recovery to do with the application. Maybe that's where ML and AI could be really useful in the I first mean, instance. You'd, you'd almost have to be at, uh, at a cloud level analysis of taking everybody's backup activity for Commvault, let's say, and saying, okay, these guys are backing up uh, Oracle database and doing a snapshot or something like that, and be able to understand how long it took, how long it took to back up, and when it was. Sort of, but I'm 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 saying that the the storage platform knows how often the actual application gets updated and when, mm -hmm. and if you extrapolate that over a number of days, you build a very easy pattern to see. I always and like to think that the storage platform is omniscient, but it's not. It really, it sees a block request or a file request or something like that. So it's not really that necessarily tied into what the applications are. You have to go up the stack to find out what the applications are. Well, not really. I think if you look at the pattern of I.O. and so on, you can actually kind of you know, make an assumption based on the Have you ever looked at an I.O. before? What's that? Have you ever looked at an I.O. before or well, 10,000 oh, no. I.O.s or something like that? Yeah, but that's hard, right? But you can actually get a machine to actually look at it in a much better way rather than uh, admin, right? Okay, I won't. I I guess that's why we would be excited. I mean, that's something maybe maybe ML or AI is the only thing that can do. Because uh, again, in in the in the days of of us being sysadmins and manually scheduling backup jobs and so on, we've all had the experience where we either judged wrong or we missed the fact that something grew a lot. Like, oh my gosh, this database that we planned that we, it could get done in a quick, in a short amount of time suddenly it takes a lot longer because suddenly there's a lot more data there and nobody told us. I mean, we've all had that kind of experience. And, Besides um, the ransomware, of course. Yes, yeah, so exactly, and the ransomware. Yeah. Too, right? that's, so that's maybe, that's maybe AI is the right idea. Maybe the idea of some kind of, I mean, I don't know if it's full on ML, AI, whatever, but maybe some kind of smart system is the right way to do that. Uh, I mean, well, let, let me just finish that one off because um, we're at a conference where a company's just bought another company. So Commvault have bought Hedvig. They're talking about integration between primary and secondary storage. Is one of the features that you could expect to see the ability for the primary storage to tell the backup system, this is the best time to do backup my data. I would have thought those were the sort of integrations you would hope that the company was working on. Yeah, one of the things that I caught yesterday during one of the discussions with um, Don Foster was actually you know, putting some kind of profile to the data so that you know, whenever the data right, uh, goes and land into a particular medium or location, basically you would know that you need to make two copies. You, know, you set a profile, you set a policy, and say that, oh, okay, at each time, this data must have two copies. And that will actually teach the backup system how to actually back it up. I, th I think that the, the key thing for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and stuff like that is to have lots and lots of data that, that's classified, that tells you what you want to know, and then you can take other people's data and apply those sort of neural algorithms against to understand how to classify that data. Now you can classify data as applications, you can classify your, your backup window, you classify how long it takes to back up a certain application. That sort of stuff, if you've got the data, you could provide some sort of analysis to. And then, and then you could feed that into schedules, and then you could take, take the storage policies of RPOs and RTO requirements and say, okay, backing up from that, seeing what does it take to actually back it up and, and maintain those snapshots and keep that, keep that stuff going. I'm going to throw a spanner in the works to that, okay. Ray. I'm going to throw a spanner in the works to that. And that's, we need to think about the fact that over time, we've migrated away from physical servers to virtual machines. And if we do move to um, containerized environments and serverless, there won't be an application entity like a VM or something to back up. We'll just be backing up data. So we're going to have to know the best time to back up the data based on it the activity on the data, because we won't have an entity to actually back up separately. I think you're going to find that containers are, are a different way of implementing applications, but in the end, 
they have they have state requirements, they have storage requirements, they have volumes that they're going to go access. So, I mean, when you fire up, uh, I don't know, a Netflix stream or something like that, there's a series of containers that get fired up, and that that application might represent, I don't know, 10 or 100 or maybe 1,000 containers or something like that, but there's, there's distinctly an application associated with that. But then there's nothing to schedule because those are temporary things that come up and go down. So yeah. you don't have to schedule them because they're, they're not, they're, the same number of containers might not exist the next day or there might be twice as many. So um, you really aren't going to be backing up in the same way. The concept of a schedule will be too dynamic and it won't make sense anymore. Well, we have our first question here. Uh, this uh, strange gentleman here. Uh, nice please catch. state your Good name, catch. sir, and uh, what you're doing here. Uh, my name is Keith Townsend, and uh, I'm a professional Instagram star. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you hit on a pretty interesting topic of stateless apps or stateless workloads, but the app configuration itself has states. So how does, how do we, to your uh, example, array of Netflix, while I might span up hundreds or thousands of, the, of, of, of workloads, whether they're containers or serverless or whatever, I still have to maintain the state of the application in the, in the database. How does that impact scheduling backups, like backing up the state of the overall system? Yeah, I mean, there's a big challenge, obviously, because the types of applications we're talking about, they run all the time. They're never down, they're never, they're never, they're never idle to some extent. So, uh, it's, it's, and to do that application consistently is, is even a more of a challenging problem. But these are NoSQL databases. They're no, it's not even a, a transaction uh, database anymore. So, some of that makes it a little bit easier to back up and to take a consistent view of them, but some of it makes it harder. So yeah, and I mean the biggest challenge is it's always on. It's never off. And you, you can't really turn off this thing, right? It's the internet. Um, no sequel, interesting um, challenge. Okay. Because obviously it could be an eventually consistent database uh, spread across many locations. But obviously we have vendors who are bringing out solutions to that, Distributed which, which is there. Yeah. But I think you're right in terms of other parts of state there, Keith, like exactly what are the containers uh, what do they look like? How are they configured? What is the relationship between them? All of that needs to be backed up as well. And whereas we might have just backed up a VM and said, we'll restore the VM and in its entirety if we need to bring back the whole VM, we're going to have to back up the container definitions in order to understand the relationships to make that part work. I, I think you have to move away from the VM version of the world when you start moving into containers and that sort of stuff. But that's a different discussion. Yeah, but I think, I think there's a lot of things that has changed. You know, if you look at the traditional databases now, there are so many types of databases, graph database, time series database. You know, and I, I agree with what Chris said, right? It's maybe time to back up the metadata about the definition of what, what the data is, you know, contained to. So yeah, I think that one of the things that's coming up here is that um, we're seeing uh, the what IT infrastructure, what IT applications look like is just changing dramatically. Instead of being that traditional monolithic system with a um, you know a state storage and, and so on, we're seeing a system where you know we could have cattle, you know we could have all these. Uh, you know, uh, containers spinning up to serve what Netflix movies or whatever, and we only care about the movies themselves. We could have, you know, no sequel. Uh, but the thing is, we also still have SQL, and we also still have stateful applications, and we also still have monolithic applications. We've just got a, a huge variety of different things now. And no, it's not practical to back up the internet on a you know weekend weekday kind of schedule that doesn't make any sense whatsoever but um but we still have to protect this data um you know how are we going to deal with this i guess uh, you know we're running a little bit low on time i do want to give if anyone else has a uh, wants to speak up uh, keith is kind of a ringer he's part of the tech field day audience as well uh but if uh, anybody else wants to speak up let me know um so how, how, do we, how do we solve this? How do we answer this core question? Is it time to move beyond traditional backup scheduling? I think it's a yes and a no kind of thing, depending on the situation. If you're looking at a large you know, uh, organization with a monolith kind of uh, software framework you know, and so on and so forth, then yes, it would be 
good to actually have that kind of discipline and regime to do that. But in the new generations of um, you know folks like Netflix, uh, Amazon, and so on, that's actually moving at the speed of light, then no. I would say we do need to just let the machine do the work because we want to get to a position where we've got self-service, automation. You know, we're not going to know that we've got certain workloads there to go in and manually rebalance them all the time. Everything's going to be changing so dynamically. We should be relying on the infrastructure to do it on our behalf. So I would say, yeah, we should be scrapping scheduling and focusing on RPO, RTO, and business requirements. I, th I think a better thing to think about is how backup can evolve under this new framework of, of containers and, and uh, you know, database machines and NoSQL databases and SQL databases. There's an evolutionary aspect of this. Yeah, some of this is still the same. It's like snapshots to some extent. Snapshots came along, all of a sudden the backup window wasn't as critical, but in the end it still is critical. It, it doesn't go away to some extent. When a container fires up and it goes out and accesses a volume and stuff like that, when a container dies or comes or terminates, that data has to be somehow you know, spun off and backed up and, 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 and metadata associated with that has to be somehow extracted and, 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 and backed up at the same time. It's, it's, uh, it's got to be done. I think it can be done. There are, there are tools out there that, that, are, that are working in this space, open source, et cetera, et cetera. But what about scheduling? What? But what about scheduling? It's going to just blow away, right? Yeah, it doesn't go away. No. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that's what uh, that's where we're at here. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions or comments? Do any of you believe that it's time to move beyond backup scheduling, or that it's not? You, you want to jump in? Oh yeah. I'll let you put your food down first. No, I mean I would say you still have to schedule, but you do it far in a far looser manner, right? So hey, this has to be done once a day, or once every four hours, and then the machine much like your work calendar, looks at the available opportunities, looks at the busyness of everything, finds a thing, and goes for it. And you just have a very, very loose scheduling, kind of dictated by past performance, and the machine looks at all the data that's happened over, I don't know, however long you've been running. And that so scheduling's not gone, but it's really, it's loose. It's based so, on business requirements. So you might answer this question focusing on the word traditional and say that traditional backup scheduling is gone, but we still need backup scheduling. Is that right? I, you don't necessarily need it, but if you're not willing to let go of that piece of control, that, hey, I need to say it has to happen this often, if you have to have a hard and set business requirement around it, then yeah, you put in a loose schedule. Otherwise, sure, just let it go. I mean, if it's, if it's not that important, then let the machine figure it out. Yeah. Let it go. 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 Sorry, I have a problem. <laughs> okay. No, I'm I'm with you on that. I, I I believe I believe so. That's I mean just to bring his comment back to my experience as a storage admin. That was one of the hardest things for me as a storage admin to do was to let it go because I used to. I mean I'm sure that a lot of you folks were like this as well. I mean when I configured a storage array, it was it was meticulous. It was carefully planned. You know every LUN. Uh, everything, like the sizes and the configurations and the RAID, er, er, everything was, was carefully planned. And then eventually I just had to let it go. And I just had to say, you know what? I'm going to let the system do its own thing. I bet you had spreadsheets with color coding in it and oh, yes. columns with certain characters. Oh, and, my spreadsheets. And God forbid okay. somebody didn't fill the spreadsheets in. Yep. You'd be in trouble. Yeah, I've done that before. Capacity planning. Yep. Nightmare. Yeah. I don't know. Th thank you. Anybody else want to jump in with a, with a question or a comment? Well, any final words, gentlemen, on the, on the panel? Um, I think, I think you, have, you hit the right um, part of the question to ask, and that was traditional, in the sense that obviously there's got to be some scheduling somewhere, of course. Um, you don't want to just throw everything in and hope it works like you used to do in the Veritas days. Um, so I think. Yes, it does, but I think we just need to let it go. We need to let it go, and we need to let the system do it. Yeah. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, let go of the control, right? But uh, just focus on the outcome, I think. I think that's more critical right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that backup scheduling can benefit from machine learning and AI and, and, and having the data that, that tells us, you know, how long did it take and when, do, when is it done? and you know, how successful it was and how can we fix it or remediate those problems. Those sort, that sort of data may exist at the Commvault level and, and maybe can be used to improve how they go about scheduling or at least help 
real analyst, real storage administrators uh, do their scheduling activities. So I believe that that exists. It's going to take time and effort to get there, but it, it can happen. The whole new world of containers and how that back up, that's subject for a different discussion. So we're really getting Disney here. So we've got Let It Go, and we've got a whole new world. Yeah. So um, it's, it's great. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this uh, Campfire chat. Uh, again, I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of Tech Field Day and Gestalt IT. And if you enjoyed this, uh, this discussion, um, I actually recommend uh, look for the On-Premise IT Roundtable podcast, which is the podcast that we record for Gestalt IT. This is basically what the podcast is like. And uh, in fact, this, I think, kind of was one of our podcasts almost. Yesterday, uh, yeah, yesterday. So we should just steal this one and publish it. Um, but anyway, look for that in the, in the, the Apple uh, or the Stitcher or whatever. Um, it's a fun podcast. And yes, we know what on-premise versus on-premises means. We named it on purpose. Uh, also, please do look for videos like this. We did another campfire session yesterday uh, here at Commvault Go. So if you go to Gestalt IT's channel on YouTube, you'll find that uh, campfire session in a, in a little while. Uh, you'll also find some interviews and discussions and so on. And as I mentioned as well, check out Tech Field Day. Just go to YouTube slash Tech Field Day and you'll find literally thousands of videos of people like us talking about nerdy stuff like this. And I, uh, I think that uh, anyone who sat through this would probably enjoy that as well. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, the panel, for uh, being part of this. And uh, thanks, Commvault, for uh, inviting us to be part of your campfire sessions. <laughs>